Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Matt, it's great. Mm. We're here another week. And Matt, I'll be honest, Mm -hmm. kind of a sleepy boy right now. And hopefully I'll be able to get through this episode of The Mistake Zone. But Mm -hmm. uh, I think Matt... Hmm. I, I haven't been sleeping well for the last few weeks and nothing, you know, too bad, no health concerns or anything. It's just mm-hmm. uh, might have been playing too much of a game we've been talking <laughs> about a lot lately. So I won't, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, subject you to talking about said game uh, anymore, uh, you know, save you and her friends from listening to it. But Matt, mm-hmm. got to ask, mm-hmm. how have you been sleeping, man? Jaron, I've actually been sleeping better lately compared to the the past like two weeks. Okay, Matt. Hmm. I don't know if you know. Don't mind me if this is TMI. You know, feel free to uh, you know uh, stake the guidelines of our uh, friendship. But Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how many hours a night do you average? Um. Uh, I think usually I am gonna be asleep for around like. Six hours is six or seven hours, depending on how uh, degen I'm. I'm being that a uh, particular night. I feel that Matt. Where I think for me personally, I'll aim for at least six hours. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. not gonna lie, Matt. <laughs> the past <laughs> few weeks that might have dipped uh, anywhere between four to five and a half. Oh, Matt, man. Jared, we're not young if anymore. A, we can't do that. We can't do that. A four-hour night, not the greatest, <laughs> Matt. Not, oh, that man. that should be illegal <laughs> for people our age. Jaron, working from home has just granted me like two extra hours of either you know sleeping later than I need to, or just like sleep in general. Man, it's it's a blessing, Matt. Mm-hmm. I feel like mm-hmm. I should be able to sleep more soundly. You know, at least get that recommended eight hours a night. But I feel like I don't, Matt. Feel mm-hmm, like I don't, mm-hmm. and then I'll get those tired migraines, which are never good. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that was our weekly check in in terms of our mortality and how it is currently fleeting, Matt. Uh-huh. <laughs> Since we're hitting all the bases at the start of this week's episode, uh, did you partake in any consumerism this week? Oh, Jared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, how hesitant you were in that, yeah, but Matt, <laughs> uh-huh. it's a mistake zone, man. Gotta share it with the class over here. Oh, man. Jaron, I was going to do it in a later segment, but since, you know, we, we brought it up now. <laughs> Jaron, there was, is a collaboration between uh, two, I think, like, very, one very important property in my life and one property that was that was very important in my life. Uh, you're talking about the Sanrio cross uh, Junji Ito collab, correct? Oh, no, no, no. Not, not that one, Jaren. Not that one, Jaren. Sorry. Okay, a, diff- fair a, different, enough, fair one, a different one. All right. All right. Jaren, it is a collaboration between the Monster Hunter franchise yes. and the Digimon franchise. Oh. <laughs> Jaren, I actually don't remember if I actually linked you this, but the there is a, like I said, a collaboration right now between uh, Monster Hunter and Digimon. Yep. And the collaboration is, do you remember kind of like um, about 25-ish years ago, there was a release of a Tamagotchi-like toy that was kind of like a brick-shaped um, yes. thing. That, and that was like the, like, I don't know what it was ever officially called, but I think like colloquial, colloquially, yep. I've always heard it called the Digi Dungeon. Matt... Mm-hmm. you're bringing the memories uh, to the forefront and they're just all flooding to me right now where, to to confirm, those eventually became Digimon Tamers, correct? Or Digivices? I forget what yeah. the official names were, but the ones you were specifically talking about were the brick ones. And yeah. 
that was where the Digivices or the Digimon Tamers, they each resembled how they looked like in the show mm-hmm. or whatever the Digimon in a cartoon was at the time, depending mm-hmm. on the season. But the original one that preceded the animation or the cartoons here, at least in North America, as you said, were horizontal in nature, um, really stylized as a brick or a, a wall, a brick's wall and yeah, the three wall. buttons on the side mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. have to ask you, Matt, mm-hmm. that was such a staple of my childhood. <laughs> and I know we probably spoke about it on the show prior, but mm-hmm. before we get into the Monster Hunter collab, Matt, what color was your original Digivice? I had two that I remember. Um, one was like the dark navy blue, and I also yep. had the kind of like bluish gray one. Nice. Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had the bright yellow one, mm-hmm. like the highlighter yellow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I feel like me owning that Digimon Tamer device really informed <laughs> what type of vibrant loud color palettes i like i gravitate (laughs) towards growing up so uh but yeah matt that was all the rage at least for the third grade and i remember Mm -hmm. at that time because we were all children this was sort of around the tamagotchi phase as well yeah and i remember everyone in my school just didn't know how to keep their Digimon alive. <laughs> uh huh. Where I remember I was the first one of everyone that I knew who had one. I got Slime on or whatever mm-hmm, and was mm-hmm. able to evolve it pretty far. And a week later, it died. Uh huh. But yeah, classic. that was my claim to fame for a hot second. But, uh, Matt, what are your fond, hopefully, memories of the Digitamer growing up? I mean, I remember really liking it because, um, Jordan, I like grew up in a very kind of like poorish school district, mm-hmm. and I remember that like our school ended up being like one of the recipients of those kind of like like kind of like Christmas gift drive things where like you know like some places like collecting all these like gifts for like kids and then they bring it to the school and that like the kids like um you know all get like a present each. Right. And the Digi Dungeon or like, you know, the Digimon Tamagotchi was the thing that I got from um that what do you call it? I guess that I don't know what to call it, like that giveaway or that like donation. And I crazy, I love the hell out of that thing, Jared. I just the same as you, I guess like oh I ended up with Numemon like a lot of the time. <laughs> but you know, the the few times that you're I was able to get like, you know, Greymon or Miramon or like, you know, some or like the one time that I ever got it past um, the champion level and got it to like uh, Mamimon, like that was, th- those are like highlights <laughs> of my of my childhood. Matt, those are some core memories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to bring it back full circle, I know we did talk about it when Bandai Namco did announce that they were bringing back, you know, that specific style of the Digimon Tamers or whatever. Yes. Uh, which I be- did, were you able to get in on that drop a few was it a year or two a few months ago a year ago or so? It was actually two drops, Jaren. Um, one at the twentieth anniversary, which I just totally missed, and then the one that uh we're talking about right now, which is the or the one that like we're referring to right now, which is the twenty fifth um anniversary version, which uh I found about out about way too late, and all the ones I could see were all uh, scalper prices, and I. They were right. bad scalper prices, Jerry. Yeah. Um, and I, I never ended up getting in on that one. So I felt like I had to jump on this uh, collab when I saw it. So if it wasn't obvious, we're talking about the Digimon Cross Monster Hunter Wilds uh, to celebrate, uh, you know, the upcoming Monster Hunter Wilds. And I don't know, this is the 20th edition of the, what is it, Matt? The Digimon... Digimon color, I guess. But Matt, mm-hmm. as you were referring to stylized in that original Digimon Digivice Tamer thing, uh, so you have the brick, you have it being primarily horizontal, but also Matt, I mm-hmm. think that brick resembles some of the monsters that we're looking at, you know, including our boy Rathalos. Mm-hmm. And um, and the second one is kind of colored as uh, Zenogre. Which, Matt, these look pretty slick. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, 
maybe I was just fascinated by how these look, but were you able to get one or both of them? Yeah, Jaren, I, I put in a order for both of them. Nice. Because uh, apparently um this was the fastest selling or fastest like booking of pre-orders that Bandai has seen for any of their products. I could see it, Matt. I could see it. Mm-hmm. Where you're banking on nostalgia, you're banking on Monster Hunter, and mm-hmm. when you were first saying that you dipped into the Monster Hunter Club, Matt, mm-hmm. I thought you were going to say that you partook in the purchase of a Rathalos Telecaster from the Monster Hunter Ooh. Cross Fender collab, and that uh-huh. that does look like a pretty good looking guitar. Not not the type of body that I'm looking forward in a guitar, but I can acknowledge mm-hmm. how mm-hmm. nice it kind mm-hmm. of looks. Mm-hmm. Jared, like, I also saw the, like, I'm considering dipping into the um, Monster Hunter Transformers collab. Ooh. <laughs> but, Jared, I'll be honest, the kind of, like, preview they put out of it looked really <laughs> looked really bad because the, they didn't do a good job of, like, the 3D animation of the toy. There's no, like, actual, like, pictures of right. the, the toy itself. It's all just, like, 3D renders. And the 3D renders didn't have, like, good... I don't know, like lighting applied to them, so they looked almost like '90s CG to me, which was uh, really rough. That's unfortunate, Matt. But mm-hmm. it's the nature of a collab, Matt. You might mm-hmm. have to. You might have to because that could be a <laughs> potential thing you can sell down the road for some sort of markup, Matt. Jared, I don't think I would ever sell like something, something like this. Fair enough. Matt, that's the lore of a collab, a good collab as well. Jared, we, we've talked about this before on the show that I, I believe inanimate objects have, have souls and feelings. And I can't, I can't like, you know, get rid of them. Like, they're just objects. And I, I think I've said on the show before, I don't purchase with the intention to resell most of the time. So if I'm buying it, I'm buying it for myself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Matt, mm-hmm. did Wallet Coon take any more beatings this week? Luckily, after this uh, very vicious uh, monster level thrashing from uh, this Monster Hunter Digimon collab, uh, Wallacoon was saved from a thrashing because I forgot to buy stuff in my Steam cart. Amazing, that Amazing. Mm-hmm. And then I missed the sales. And Jaren, I'm not going to buy something that I put in my Steam cart because it was on sale after the sale already happened. That's how they get you, Matt. That's how they get you. But luckily, they're, I don't know, Steam sale, probably around the corner, the fall sale, the mm-hmm. autumn sale, usually mm-hmm. in a month or two. But Matt, mm-hmm. you just reminded me that <laughs> I hit up that vendor on Marketplace again, and I need to e-transfer him tonight for the upcoming uh, Pokemon TCG Surging Sparks booster box <laughs> that oh, I asked man. him <laughs> to put me down for. But mm-hmm. Matt, hmm We like to celebrate uh, W's here on the Mistake Zone. Mm -hmm. And I think today someone was also celebrating something really special, not only to me, but I guess to them personally. And that Mm -hmm. we discussed this a few weeks ago where, you know, the official Tony Hawk's Pro Skater socials were, you know, teasing something with a banner celebrating the 25th anniversary for this, you know, Mm -hmm. legendary franchise and Mm -hmm. you know hot off the presses matt uh tony hawk posted on instagram earlier today to celebrate said 25th anniversary of the franchise and it was a reel that had just a bunch of footage and it was accompanied by a caption a pretty heartfelt one too just tony hawk expressing his gratitude to just everyone involved and all the players throughout the years and i know when we discussed this earlier in the month we were kind of guessing what we could potentially announce um you know Mm -hmm. to celebrate this milestone and you know taking some snippets from what tony posted in that instagram post he notes that the original tony hawks pro skater was released exactly 25 years ago today Mm -hmm. My intention and expectation for the game was mostly for the enjoyment of skateboarders. I had no idea it would transcend a niche market to become a massive success and, as some have argued, changed the course of skateboarding's popularity and possibly even trick, uh, skate trick evolution. He ends off the, again, you can read this on his official Instagram, but he ends off this caption with, 
thanks to Activision, Neversoft, RIP, and all of you that played THPS in those formative years. I'm not supposed to tease anything else about the future of the series, but there will be a future. Oh, man. And he signs off with right down circle, a.k.a. the classic how you pull off the 900 uh, by mm. default in the original Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 25 years ago. Uh, Matt, mm-hmm. I know we had, or at least I had a lot of high hopes earlier uh, in the month when we addressed this, but to see the 25th anniversary come with, you know, just a heartfelt message from Tony Hawk, uh, I'll have to admit, a bit disappointed this wasn't accompanied by an official announcement for something, but mm-hmm. as long we do have some sort of tease, some sort of, I wouldn't say guarantee, but I hint that there will still be a future uh, to this franchise, but who knows in what form and shape oh, that will be where I don't know mentioned it earlier again that three and four was in the works to some capacity and then vicarious visions uh, became I believe Blizzard Albany so I'm not even sure what this future that he's hinting at will be in you know under Activision uh, as a Microsoft you know, own subs- or whatever company at this point. But mm-hmm. Matt, here's hoping. I'm still hoping that we do get something, whether that's the form of Tony Hawk 3 DLC for 1 and 2, uh, re-release of the remake for the new generation of consoles, or even if that means a new game. Uh, I'm just hoping that oh, this man. is something of note. And I'm, I'm hoping, Matt, that this isn't, I don't know. I hope that there's still that dedication that was put into one and two as opposed to uh, cash grab territory. And that would be my hope, Matt, moving forward Mm -hmm, for the mm -hmm. Tony Hawk franchise. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Before we move on, Matt, anything, uh, any thoughts on the 25th anniversary of the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series? I mean, Jaren, the... But there will be a future is, like, really wild (laughs) to me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because, like, I kind of wonder what they would do with the franchise. Um, Whether it's just going to be, you know, more remasters or if there's going to be, like, a new mainline, a mainline Tony Hawk game. Like, Like, okay, do you think that it is possible for there to be, like, a new Tony Hawk game or, like, a new, um, like, underground game? I feel like there definitely can be. Again, it's it's hard to say because with 1 and 2, that became pretty much the best-selling uh, entry in the franchise, if I recall correctly. But at mm-hmm. the same time, Vicarious Visions was rewarded with, hey, why don't you work on Diablo moving forward? <laughs> Where I think they did set a really good foundation with 1 and 2, where if you wanted to introduce 3... Uh, maybe a three and four, even though that might be a bit difficult just because if you follow the discourse online for and even underground or such totally different games than what the traditional progress was for one, two, and even three. But if you were to ask me, you know, when one and two came out where Mm -hmm. again, vicarious visions, I feel like have earned, uh, their attempt at an original Tony Hawk. So if maybe they were able to go to members who have worked into the on that game and say, hey, work on something brand new, I think that would be really cool. But at the same time, considering the current state of Activision and how they're releasing games and even Microsoft to the to a similar degree, it's really hard to say what they can actually do. Where, again, the hope would be that three, four, even underground um, remaster, but maybe at the end of the day, this is your Tony Hawk's greatest tricks, where you're just getting levels from all these different games and then having the same progression as in a Tony Hawk one to three, as opposed to the open world nature of four and underground. But that's mm-hmm. kind of me where. 
as much as I do want to see something original, I'm not sure what we're going to see considering how we haven't seen anything off the success of one and two. But that's okay. just me rambling, Matt. Uh, Matt, what would you want to see from the Tony Hawk franchise? Jaren, I kind of, like, other than, like, a new game, I honestly just want to see more Blizzard characters in Tony Hawk. Fair, Matt. I feel like the last time we talked about this, you mentioned something like, oh, they can replace the, you know, the special characters that they can't get the uh, licensing for anymore with, like, Sylvanas or something. And that's just been, like, living in my head. (laughs) I mean, considering... With Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, we had Spider-Man and they were replaced in the 1 and 2 remaster with, I think, the Roswell Alien, I believe, where you would hope that now under the Microsoft umbrella, that might mean, oh, bring back Doom Guy, when, even though he was in the PC version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. Matt, it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> bring back Doom Guy if you're going to re-release or every put... Tony Oxford Skater 3 in the remaster. Uh, put John Halo in it. Uh, Master Chief seems oh, like a man. good fit at this point. Where, mm-hmm. I don't know, Matt, where looking at who's in Heroes of the Storm right now, you can probably put in some WoW character. Matt, mm-hmm. you should put in Tracer, I feel like. <laughs> oh, yeah, Tracer would fit. I think Tracer would fit. Where possibilities are endless, but at the same time, oh, we... Lucy. Oh, wait, no, Lucio skates. Like rollerblades, so he doesn't yeah. use a skateboard. <laughs> but yeah, Matt, it's been so long where seeing that header be updated gave me some hope. But now it's mm-hmm. just, I want to believe you, Tony. I want to believe you. But at the same time, we're still, we're getting so far removed from that remake or that uh, remaster that, I don't know. Hopefully it's for the best, though. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matt. Mm-hmm. I mentioned the Roswell alien who was an unlockable character in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, where I think I need to do a quick weekly check-in for UFO 50. Mm-hmm. And Matt, I mm-hmm. played a few more games, was exploring a bit more, and I found two additional titles that I'm currently addicted to. Mm-hmm. Uh In all, I played three new games just based on the cover art, as I kind of said last week. But the first one I played that was really scratched that pick up and play itch was one of the later, quote unquote, released games of Seaside Drive. And that this is reminiscent of a shooter where Mm -hmm. your play, your character is in a cool convertible and you either go for holding forward will let you drive forward and that kind of charges your attack meter or depletes your attack meter because the whole time you're shooting into the sky at various you know planes and helicopters that are in turn shooting at you Mm -hmm. so it does become a shooter in that regards and to kind of recharge your attack meter um, you hold back to do a drift. And even though you're kind of drifting on a horizontal plane, Matt, that idea mm. of drifting to recharge your ammo or make your shots more powerful seems pretty cool. But yeah, it's your basic shooter. So it's one of those. I like it in theory, but I've only made it to stage two because as I said before, Matt, these games are hard. Uh-huh. Uh, but in terms of the two games I'm currently addicted to, Matt, the first game is called Party House. And this is uh, yes. equivalent to a deck builder of sorts. Mm-hmm. Because I Matt, think this is like one of the more popular games. I really like uh, Party House because mm-hmm. your whole the whole premise of the game is you're trying to throw the ultimate house party. Mm-hmm. And to do that, you need to invite uh, roller decks of people you know to your house party so basically the way the game works is this you have 25 turns to get yourself a four star house party and basically to get those stars you need to have four people in a party at once that have a a star rating each so you're trying to um, invite star people to your party in order to do so you have to be able to buy them, essentially. Mm -hmm. So when you start the game off, you have, let's say, Matt, in layman's terms, five party spaces. And then you go to your door 
and you draw from your current Rolodex of part people you know uh, into your party. So you start off with, say, five party spots. You go to the door five times, and then you have five people in your party. And at the end of your party, you'll either get popularity from each each member of the um, or each person you can invite either has popularity attached to them or cash mm-hmm. attached to them. You can use popularity and bank that to invite more popular people that have their own popularity score. Or you can use the cash to either increase the amount of people you can invite to your party or use specific skills. And the whole point of the game is within those 25 turns to ha- save up enough popularity or manage enough popularity to start buying the people who have star ratings and then also ha- buy people with skills to enable you to invite all four of them or five of them into your party at once. So it becomes a deck builder of sorts of, okay, Early game, I might want to start with farming popularity or I want to start farming money just so I can kind of attack it this way. And then there's the also element of, you know, people being rowdy, Matt, where Mm -hmm. some people have a rowdiness attached to them where if a party gets too rowdy, the cops will come, uh, close down your party and you don't get any popularity. You don't get any cash from that Mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, Matt. It's really scratching at those deck building sensibilities that I typically like to enjoy um, and trying to figure out, okay, how do I build my deck of friends to best complete this? So there are, I believe, five levels in all with different scenarios, uh, with different party guests with each of their own attributes. And then the final one, I believe, is just random, gives you random people, uh, gives you random um uh, you know, abilities that you can play around with. So it's really cool. Really like trying to figure out how to best build my deck of friends. But Matt, Mm -hmm. the second game I've been into this week is called Pilot Quest. And this is one of those games that really on its surface, I thought was your typical, you know, farming sim where you're a pilot, you crash land on this alien planet, and it's up to you to build up resources to fix your ship and leave. And you start off pretty basic. There's this big glowing crystal uh, in the middle of the map. You start hitting it, you get moon currency, and then you can use that moon currency to buy Mm -hmm. seeds, and then that makes sea... um, You're able to plant plants that generate moon currency for you and then at that point you use that moon (laughs) currency to um to forage ingots and then you use those ingots to build houses that allows aliens to live there and then you can use those aliens to make you more currency and that it becomes an Mm -hmm. idle game of sorts Uh Uh where Uh it's one of those things that okay i Sure, you can turn the game off and then come back and you'll have more currency. But Matt, Mm -hmm. if you want the most currency, you leave this bad boy running and then you use the Steam controller function to make it so you click R3 to repeatedly press X. So you're repeatedly hitting that diamond in the middle of the level to help generate currency. But on... That's what the game is on its face. Mm -hmm. The real meat of the game is the wilds. (laughs) section Uh where it's essentially becomes an extraction game at that point where you can use some of your currency to buy meat because Matt you need meat to survive in the wilds Mm -hmm. and I believe you can buy up to six at a time but you can also find meat in the wild where essentially one meat gives you 60 seconds in the wilds and you use that time to explore kill enemies and discover secrets because that's where you further get more current different currency to unlock different things from the scientists at your base uh find your different ship pieces and ultimately uncover secrets of this planet and it's the fact that the meat doubles as not only a timer of okay this is how long I need to explore and I need to come back before the timer expires or I'm just going to die on the spot and lose everything. But it also is your life in a way where if you're attacked by an enemy, you shave off seconds from uh, the timer. So it becomes this balance of how far do I want to push? 
how far, how much meat do I need to bring in? And will I be able to make it back in time before I lose all my progress? So it's a lot more in-depth than I thought it was going to be at a glance, I thought it was just going to be an idle game that I can just have it. I uh, hit it, my character just automatically hitting this crystal. But mm-hmm, Matt, mm-hmm. Uh, pretty soon, once you finish everything you need from that currency, you have to venture into the wilds. And ah, Matt, I, I in pure extraction game, Jaren, this I've pushed too far. I've lost a lot of progress <laughs> and. It made me feel real bad. But yeah, between Pilot Quest and Party House, Matt, there are some gems in UFO 50. And those are the games that I'm currently, you know, going back to in addition to the Magic Garden game. Because Mm -hmm. Matt, Mm got to try to push that high score as well. Mm. But UFO 50 aside, Matt, Mm -hmm. there was another release this week or last week not necessarily a release but a demo for an upcoming game and yes that, this mm-hmm. has something been something on our radar because we are atlas boys at heart mm-hmm. uh but matt the prologue demo of metaphor free fantasio mm-hmm. has come out and yes. this is a beefy boy demo matt mm-hmm. because it, mm-hmm. I, as the name implies this is the prologue of the game and of course not of course, but the growing trend of any progress you make in this demo will carry on until the full game when it does come out, if you so choose to purchase it. Mm-hmm. And I believe this demo is, it hovers around five to six hours. Ye- and Yeah, <laughs> yes, sort of, yeah. I think you finished the prologue demo, correct, Matt? Yes. And um... I told you where I landed, so I, I think we've, played enough of it to kind of talk about it and give our thoughts. But Matt, Mm -hmm. as at least Persona Atlas Boys, uh, how was your, according to Steam, 6.6 hours with Metaphor? (laughs) Jaren, I enjoyed it. I've set myself up very nicely for um, when the game fully releases because, Jaren, within this demo, towards the very end, there was a spot where you can (laughs) really hard grind yourself to, to be overpowered very, very quickly. So, Matt, you're saying that... Because I didn't, as I said, didn't finish the prologue demo. Mm-hmm. For us being friends for as long as we have, you're yes. saying that I should finish this demo and start grinding it out just in case. No, Jared. Okay. Because the grinding thing that I'm talking about, there is an optimal day setup. Oh. But you can't do it within the demo because... um. The way the demo ends is that you get to like, I think like a certain boss and then the demo will end or you exceed a certain amount of days. Right. And Jaren, since you have to, you know, since the demo will end on the uh, boss, you can't optimize the um, grind route in terms of a day spent. You can save a day in the real game because because of this. So you 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 are going to be starting from a save that is not at the end of the uh <laughs> the demo if you want to, you know, really squeeze out the time. Which I Matt, which I do. Uh-huh. Which uh-huh. I do. But I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yes. Matt, mm-hmm. What is metaphor? Metaphor Refantasio is a turn-based RPG that is very very much a persona like game um there is a lot of the same trappings that the um i guess like modern persona series has like you know you have your uh you know your your stylized music uh, stylized menus you have um you know a group of people coming together and getting stuff that are like personas but they're not personas uh you're making you know social bonds with people you're you know battling people and like you know exploiting a elemental weakness kind of um strategy within the the turn-based battles to get advantages and you're like running through dungeons and you're you're all doing this in a time crunch style system let's face it matt there's a velvet there's essentially a velvet room yeah also essentially a velvet room yes 
where not instantly mm-hmm. right off the jump, I think that's one of the first things I noticed as well is the UI itself full of style. And I feel like this is what Atlas RPGs are pretty much known for in 2024 mm-hmm. at this mm-hmm. point. But at the same time, again, I'm coming into this as a Persona fan, you know, not necessarily a Shin Megami Tensei fan, mm-hmm. where it's hard for me to play through this, uh, f- to play through the metaphor prologue demo and not constantly look at how this can potentially inform how future personas are. Even in the demo, you know, when you're in the royal capital for a hot second, you're yes. walking down the street and there's just people chattering around you and you seeing the thought bubble. I oh. thought that was just a, you know, we saw bits and pieces of that in Persona 5. Mm-hmm. And this to me seems like the next logical step in at least how that idea is presented, where I can definitely see this returning in a Persona 6, depending on what um, route they take with it. But... I see. Jaron, I kind of hope they don't. Really? Yes. In particular, with the kind of like, all the kind of like talking. Because, yes. Jaron, I find it so messy. I really it... don't like how it looks with all these like kind of bubbles showing up all these kind of like it's not even like even words sometimes it's kind of like the static effect going around everywhere i think it looks i i just aesthetically don't really like the way it looks yeah where the do you return to the royal capital in the prologue demo or is that just kind of the all you really get to experience of it so far in that you know beginning portion of it um it's kind of the royal capital ends up kind of just being your from what i can tell so far it seems like it's going to be the hub Okay. Um, so you're going to be probably like going back and forth. But yeah, I do agree that initially walking down that street, it was a bit messy and distracting. But at the same time, I feel like uh, when you're walking through Shibuya in Persona 6, if that's where, just because you always walk through Shibuya, like yeah. I can pretty much see it being presented at like that. But I agree that it should be a lot cleaner because it was pretty distracting as well. Really distracting and kind of messy, as you said. Mm-hmm. But Matt, uh-huh. even though we're making comparisons to Persona, it is a, you know, it takes more of a fantasy a- approach. This is that medieval fantasy that we're pretty much used to, at least I'm used to when I think mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. Um, more classic JRPGs. And I know we made the goof when this was first revealed, but Matt, this is probably what the Fire Emblem cross uh, Shin Megami Tensei collab should have been, but mm-hmm. that I do like, you know, it is, I don't want to say a trend, but something that is more common in games nowadays where, you know, you have a lot of lore, you have a lot of characters and concepts being introduced where I do like how in the middle of dialogue, you can hit, I forget which button it is, but to mm-hmm. essentially bring up your compendium uh, just to give you additional context of what's being talked about. Because, Matt, yeah. mm-hmm. a lot of things going on, and I really do like that kind of uh, accessibility approach to uh, kind of get mm-hmm. you up to speed uh, and remind you of what's up with this game. Yeah, and... like, for how easy it is to get to the... I think they call it the memorandum or something like yep. that. Memorandum or something. For how easy it is to get to that and how, like, kind of fluid it is to both, you know, get to that and be able to see your like chat history or dialogue history mm-hmm. the game is a very very good about um providing you with information you need very easily which i do appreciate mm-hmm. but not mm-hmm. this is literally medieval fantasy persona yeah, uh, yeah. mc looks like boy agus and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it's just running through all the different tropes right now so yeah um Matt, before we get into it, what mm-hmm. do you think of the our protagonist so far, and I guess your uh, sidekick in Galica? I like that they explain that the music comes from the fairy. Yep. Um, I think that's a good goof. Um, I don't know if you can, but I feel like since the music is coming from her, you should be able to select what music you're listening to. Matt, um, you know that's coming, and Matt, uh-huh. I know it's probably. I was going to say it's probably out there, but given how some of it has been contextualized so far in the demo, 
Mm-hmm. I think there's definitely going to be a Persona D- uh, BGM DLC pack, and oh, I, I think I think there is already. I think the oh, is there <laughs> the the found like the founder edition or whatever the deluxe edition. The deluxe edition definitely already comes with Persona outfits. Um, I'm pretty sure it also comes with their music. At first, I would have thought that oh, that's kind of out there, but Matt. Mm -hmm. Given how this game starts and even like the meta narrative implications, Mm -hmm. I think you having access to Persona background music totally makes sense in this game. Yeah, Yeah, okay. I'm looking at the Steam page right now. Over 50 DLC costumes, battle battle BGMs, and jingles. Man. So Mm -hmm. that's for the Atlas 35th Digital Anniversary Edition, right? Yes. Not this game's expense. Not... Games are expensive in 2024. <laughs> Stop me if you've heard this before. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Oh, but, man, Jaren, $93 Canadian for the standard edition. <laughs> and for the Atlas 35th uh, Digital Anniversary Edition that I'm looking at, $133.49. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hard pill to swallow, Matt. Hard pill to swallow. Oh. But, yeah, yeah Matt, mm-hmm. again... As fans of at least the Persona games from Atlas and Snowboard Kids, which I always have, I'm <laughs> mm-hmm. obligated to say whenever we talk about Atlas. Um, how, yeah, just general thoughts on the prologue demo. I like the prologue demo. I think that it's, um, you know, more interesting to have this in a not so Japanese uh, setting. Mm-hmm. Um, this does, I guess, like feel a lot more like the Shin Megami Tensai games in terms of like setting. Which is, you know, a nice change of pace. Um, for people who are wondering and don't want to look it up, the default character name is Will. So, you know, do it that what you will. You don't need to put in a, you know, particularly Japanese sounding name to fit into the world. Fair. Um, Jaren, there is one thing related to names where at the very start, um, kind of unique to this game that isn't in the um, other, I guess, like Persona games or in the Persona games, not the other one, but you give a name to yourself or like yep. someone who's like referring to you the player and when they when you give them a name they say oh what a strange name it's like unusual for for what we hear here but i wonder if like they've programmed this so that if you give them a name that is like within that world already they'll give you a different dialogue option where that's kind of what i was at Not necessarily referring to, but it is, again, that element of, I guess, meta narration where Mm -hmm. with at least within the prologue demo, there seems to be a lot of, you know, mention and highlighting of the book that the main character will. uh, We both named him Charlie for (laughs) Mm -hmm. reasons uh, that Charlie holds on to and how it is a fantasy book uh, created by. Uh, the author that you meet, who, again, in turn becomes another social link. But that's something I wanted to ask you, Matt. With the idea of fantasy and this book, you know, playing uh, not necessarily significant or at least make having underlines put underneath it when you're introduced to it. Matt, Mm -hmm. over under, what do you think about the main character and his friends book hopping and actually seeing that utopia at some point in this game. Oh, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like that won't happen within the game itself. I feel like that's a, a, Oh, they've reached the end and now they're like crossing into the book, um, Mm -hmm. dimension or whatever. Where, when you, as you said, when you're given your quote unquote real name, Mm-hmm. You're you have this background that looks pretty modern, where I don't know. I feel like there is some that has to play a really big part in just how this game is portrayed because we are introduced to what seems to be not necessarily the main antagonist, but the antagonist of the demo in uh, Louise, mm-hmm. and Matt. That's what I was kind of thinking as well, where I know you mentioned when we were kind of talking and show prepping, you mentioned that this does have at least roots in the idea of an isekai, where Mm -hmm. I think with that thought in mind and this idea of, you know, this fantasy land in this book that the main character keeps holding, you know, what are the chances that Luis is 
someone from our dimension per, or something where maybe that's what helps guide why we enter a real name uh, in the beginning. And the game acknowledges that we're peering into this world where I don't know if I'm looking into stuff and making it more weirder than it is. And maybe this is just your basic medieval fantasy JRPG that they're trying to tell. But I don't know for it to start in that way. I feel like some zaniness has to happen, but that might just be me. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like there has to be some kind of a crossover into the real world in some way. Mm-hmm. But like, like I said, I think it's going to be more so a, and then somehow at the end, the characters like go into the real world. And, you know, if they do something post game, it's going to be like, kind of like a persona three is like the answer. Where okay. now there's just like this whole thing um, in, I don't know, in, in the quote-unquote, like, real world. Okay. that That's what I expect, at least, if, if, if anything, like, related to that at all. Where I think those were enough hooks to really get me interested just to see where this story can potentially go. But on the flip side, mm. Matt, we're introduced to a bunch of characters that will hopefully make you fall in love with them as well and <laughs> get you to continue playing. So, Matt... Mm-hmm. Uh, let's go down the list. Uh, we went through our boy Charlie and Galaga. How did you feel about the stern father figure character? Uh, what's his name? Garrus? Yes. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Jaren. He's a, he's, a, he's a good character. I actually um I actually very much like the lore for his race. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember what it is right now. But it is that, like, you know, they live for a, you know, like, twice as long as, like, any other um, species or tribe, yeah. I guess, is what they was what they use in the uh, in the game. And, like, him being kind of, like, old there, once you read that, makes you realize how old this guy, like, actually is. Where if Matt, mm-hmm. I'll be honest, when we mm-hmm. first are introduced to him, I legit thought he was going to eat it during the demo. Uh, I haven't finished the demo, so he might eat it as well, but um, I thought the chances of that were further reduced when you could assign him uh, a role. And I guess Mm. that brings us to one of the main mechanics, Matt, uh, in place of the personas, you have archetypes or hero Mm -hmm. archetypes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matt, yes. can you break down the arc before we keep exploring characters? Can you break down Mm -hmm. the archetype system and what you think of it? So the archetype system is actually very interesting. Um, the archetype system is, in essence, personas, but you kind of pull them out of the equivalent of social links, where every time you make like a new social link with somebody, um, which in this game they're called bonds, every time you make a new bond, you are going to be getting a new archetype. And these archetypes kind of act as kind of structures on how your stats are going to... Um, I don't know if grow is necessarily the right word, but like how they're going to be like affected, um, how your or like what skills and like abilities you're going to have access to and what uh, strengths and weaknesses you are going to um, have as a character and being able to change everybody's, I guess, like weakness is very interesting because... Mm -hmm. Within the first kind of dungeon of the the mines, being able to change your weakness really, really changes the difficulty of that dungeon. Yeah. If you know um, what you are going to fight, you can spec away from what the enemy is going to do to you. Um, there is a particular fight in the kind of like first dungeon that you do that is if you're kind of just like following what the game is giving you and you know you're kind of just like assigning your archetypes as like you get them yeah that fight is like next to impossible but if you Mm -hmm. like kind of respect your party's archetypes that fight is a cakewalk um and i'm really really interested in seeing how much these um archetypes are going to play in the difficulty of the game especially with how the 
kind of like battle system works in this game mm-hmm. um, because the turn crystals mechanic is really interesting. And I kind of wonder how valid it is um, once you have recon on everybody. Right. Because like the the new, I guess, like the kind of like game mechanic within the turns for uh, this game is that everybody on your team contributes a turn crystal. And when you do an action as a character, you expend the turn crystal. And, you know, once you run out of turn crystals, the other... Um, your opponents will go. They have the kind of same system, and then it goes back to you. You spend your turn crystals again. And when you hit weaknesses, you only expend half a crystal. And that lets you, you know, do more stuff on your side of the team. Um, there are also, also other actions like skipping um, that let you spend less turn crystals. But I think, like, what's very interesting is at the start of the game, there is the kind of like the whole system of you know figuring out the enemy's weakness Mm -hmm. when you're kind of like you know kind of nuking through your your spells to see what a new enemy is weak to and if you happen to hit a you know elemental weakness where they block it it expends an extra turn crystal Mm. and if they absorb it it just ends your whole side's turn yeah and i think that is a very interesting mechanic but I feel like it's a little wasted because, you know, after the first time you do that, you're not going to do it anymore. Yeah. And I feel like that's kind of a loss of, you know, just that system. I'm really curious how far this really goes, just because, you know, similar to my reference point of the Persona games, once you figure out your rotation once you figure out Mm -hmm. everyone's weakness of a dungeon it really becomes not that exciting anymore you know yeah and that's kind of amplified in royale when you do when you finally get ryuji's like insta kill um skill and at that point you're essentially just beelining to the final boss Mm -hmm. where i think it is still a battle system that can potentially be fleshed out depending on how enemies react to it where again if we're looking so far everyone i've battled has just been you know your basic grunts and Mm -hmm. um you'll get to your big monstrosities which we all probably get to in a minute but i think given how the world's being set up something like bosses or enemies that might be able to i know this goes against what a JRPG is, but similar to how you can optimize yourself for a dungeon, maybe there might be particular enemies that can change their resistances on the fly Mm -hmm, as well, mm -hmm. which I think would create some more interesting, you know, battle scenarios or that might even be delegated to something within the hard difficulty or above. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I think as you said, Matt, once you, figure out your weakness rotation, then it's pretty self-explanatory how battles are going to go. And again, if you're at a high enough level, you can just instantly kill them in the world map. Where I think actually, I don't think I've seen this before, but enemy resistance manipulation might be a way for you to get more variety or more out of this battle system before you you get powerful enough for it to be pretty much wasted at that point as you said Mm -hmm. i think like the thing i'm waiting on right now to see how it works is that um at the early game you really only get the skills that let you you know single target cast magic and i'm wondering how the kind of weakness system of getting the half turn or half a turn crystal spent versus the you know the block and absorb penalties will work once you are you know Casting, hey, hit everybody with this type of magic. Right. And you have, like, you know, enemy groups that have varying weaknesses. Like, I wonder what happens, you know, if you hit somebody that's weak to the spell, but you hit somebody else that's, like, blocking or absorbing the spell. And I'm wondering what that's going to do to the turn crystals and how that affects the value of, like, you know, multi target spells. That, Mm -hmm. it just occurred to me for that Atlas DLC. I I wish part of that DLC, like, Rename the skills to their Shin Megami. Oh, 
Yeah, Jared. Oh, man. I was, you know, like, I don't mind that, like, they they use a different naming convention, but I was really looking forward to busting out a Bufu. Nah, come on. Let's mm-hmm. be real. This is medieval persona. At this point, might as well just go all the way and, and then uh-huh. give me my Augies, my Bufus, my Zios, my Dios. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. maybe it's because I didn't look into it, but early game, how did you feel about your party members controlling themselves? Ooh, Jared, I was scared that that's how it was going to be for the whole game. <laughs> yeah. I was I was so, so worried. I was like, you know, looking through the menus to see, oh, th- is it just like, you know, like like that by default? But mm-hmm. I'm so glad that uh, they give you control uh, like a bit later. Matt, mm-hmm. I too was pretty worried because our boy Stroll, at least early game, dude uh-huh. was blasting everything with Augie or the flame spells. <laughs> and I was getting really yeah. annoyed there. I mean, but Jared, he was just excited to get his igniter. Fair enough, Matt. But Mm -hmm. I guess once a character has awakened, uh, you're able to have full control of them as well, which that's the case, correct? Or Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, which, yeah, I'm uh, a fan of. But yeah, looking at your archetype grid, Matt, there is a lot of spaces for archetypes. Yeah, I'm really uh, curious to see how their variety goes. Uh, There's a lot. I think they show it to you inside the... um... Inside of Academia, the like mm-hmm. Velvet Rune equivalent, there's a second floor that you can access via a ladder, and you can just like see the names of all the um, archetypes <laughs> that you'll have. It's nuts, Matt. But mm-hmm. overall, I know this is probably something we're going to be talking about once the full game uh, comes up. But for me personally, Matt, re- it left a good impression on me. I'm actually excited mm-hmm. to go uh, to see where the story goes, the characters that have been introduced. Our wall, like I, I do like uh, Galica as your companion or your main companion, mm-hmm. uh, but at the same time, I have it in my head of, I don't know if I'm setting myself up for disappointment, but as I was rambling on, it's that possibility of a potential meta narrative that, it, or I don't even know if meta narrative is the right phrase to use, but that's what I'm kind of looking forward to to see how they capitalize on this idea of this fantasy world in a book that Will or Charlie is holding. But Mm -hmm. Matt, what are Mm -hmm. your closing thoughts on the prologue demo? I mean, I liked it. I thought it left a very good impression. Um, I guess something we didn't talk about yet is the um, equivalent of like skills, which in this game are called virtues. It's Mm -hmm. like the, you know, the the courage, wisdom, you know, that sort of like eloquence, like, you know, kind of equivalent. Yeah. Um, Jaren, I think... My one of my favorite changes is that um up in, in in the Persona games when you're leveling those up you kind of don't really have an idea of how far along you are yeah but in this one there's like a thing that moves <laughs> so you can see how far you are into like you know level one of the skill and how far away it is from level two which That's is pretty good That's yes pretty a good. very very good change where that mm-hmm. I feel like this game can be min max to heck. Oh where yeah. Oh yeah. I, mm-hmm. that, I'm I'm curious if how fast it will take for that min max <laughs> guide the, to come out. Mm-hmm. Jaren, the optimization for the archetypes, I think, is going to is like I think what is going to make um the the dungeons right. in terms of hey I can I can now like move away from all the weaknesses, um and I think that like actually very very well jives with the way you play Jaren. Because like it very much promotes grinding. This game yep. does really promote grinding, especially with um, I don't know. I I th- I'm guessing you didn't get to it yet, but they have an inheritance system where no, I haven't gotten to it yet. Then yeah, where um for the archetypes you can pull skills you've gained as one archetype into an like your current active archetype. So good. So, so good. you know those the that grinding is is gonna be really really good. Where, yeah, I'm looking forward to the full release, Matt. Not looking forward to the price tag. So hopefully mm-hmm, he mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. might find some sales and discount codes out there. But yeah, Metaphor, uh, out in two weeks, I believe. Uh, yes. De- prologue demo out now. Um, 
progress transfers over. Uh, one thing I didn't like, I'm playing the Steam version. Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't like how I'm using a controller, but the moment I alt-tab, uh, all the UI goes to keyboards and it doesn't oh. convert back to controller, yeah. and that makes me <laughs> real sad. Jeremy, when I was trying to grab, you know, screenshots for uh, for the, you know, possible show art, I I kept noticing they just switched back to keyboard, which makes sense, but, you know, it's weird. It is weird, but Matt, mm-hmm. This is going on a Beefy Boy episode, but mm-hmm. we ha- we should mention that also last week, that new Sony State of Play to yes. show us the near future of what's coming to the PlayStation and not necessarily going to talk about the PS5 Pro. Uh, Matt, mm-hmm. all I'm going to say is, as Canadians, priced out of that real quick. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Priced out of that real quick, but... I slept on trying to get me one of those anniversary uh, PlayStation 5 Pros and not mm-hmm. uh, managed to snag a controller somehow. I'm curious oh, nice. if Amazon will cancel that order. <laughs> <laughs> because Matt, after I placed that order, it was sold out on the website. So mm. it's either I got the last one or that's going to be canceled sometime within the next few weeks. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. uh some things that stuck uh, stood out to me for the latest state of play, uh, Matt. Three hundred mm. years after the Ghost of Tsushima in twenty twenty five, we'll see Ghost of Yote. Yes. Um, looking forward to this. I believe what these showed off was mostly cinematics, but some stuff could have been gameplay as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I saw looked good. Though I have to admit, Matt's still mm-hmm. waiting on uh, the right price for me to <laughs> play uh, Tsushima. But uh, for that to be the last announcement, I think well deserved considering not what else was mm-hmm. really shown there. I think something of that caliber w- should be uh, what you end off a state of play or at least a direct equivalent with. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I going through some stuff that interested me as well. Uh, our boy uh, Astro uh, with Astrobot. Mm-hmm. He showed off some of the upcoming free DLC, which will... I know I know this was announced previously, but uh, the DLC will include five new online speedrun levels and 10 new bots to rescue. Uh, Matt, mm-hmm. Astrobot still remains one of the games I want to play immediately if I ever get a PlayStation 5 or hope that this comes to the PC in some capacity. But I think at that point, I'd probably have a PlayStation 5 by then, hopefully. But Mm -hmm. Matt, what else from the state of play stood out to you? Um, Jaron, I liked the kind of style that the Midnight Walk had. Mm -hmm. The kind of like claymation, stop motion aesthetic was like, you know, very nice to me. I, I really like, you know, appreciated that style. Shown um, right after Astrobot, I believe, which mm-hmm, was also mm-hmm. a good contrast as well. Mm-hmm. Jared, I feel like I have to mention Hell is Us just because of these sunken face people, which yeah. I, I always like in this aesthetic. And also, um, I think even before we started doing this recording, Jared, the Uzumaki uh, anime has started. I think it premiered on Adult Swim um, yesterday based on this uh, the day that we're recording this. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe mm-hmm. something to uh, discuss next week, Matt. Hmm. Hmm. Um, Jaren, I was so surprised um, when I saw Arc Age Chronicles. To that. Hmm. What is that, Jaren? This is an MMO, which is honestly in the year twenty twenty four, so wild to see. That. Hmm. Before we started recording, some of our friends are playing WoW right now. Where? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Jaren, that's 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 WoW. No, dude, but dude. Mm-hmm. what I mean by that is the MMO space. I know people love MMOs. And again, mm-hmm. this is my closed, uh, you know, I guess closed mindedness at this point where I feel like the MMO market is so hard to penetrate where yeah. people have their comfort games. People are, you know, playing WoW well on the daily. People are playing FF14 on the daily where, you know, having a new MMO in 2024 seems like a huge undertaking where I'm mm-hmm. really curious to see uh, now that you mentioned how this will play out. Yeah. Like, I mean, at least it's like a sequel MMO because like, mm-hmm. Arc Age, I, I remember like going like pretty hard in when yep. it came out and really enjoying it. Um, and I only really quit because my guild fell apart, but that, isn't that mm-hmm. why we always quit MMOs? <laughs> yeah. 
Jared, once the social asset is gone, I I can't I can't stay there anymore. Fair enough, Matt. But Matt, mm-hmm. speaking about legacy gaming, we mm-hmm. I know this was leaked kind of prior to the show, but uh, Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver One and Two Remastered uh, released December tenth. Mm-hmm. Uh, Matt, mm-hmm. I saw a lot of people freaking out about this online. I have to ask you: Do you have any attachment to the Soul Reaver games, Jared? Unfortunately, I do not. I mm-hmm. honestly don't know a thing about them. This the Soul Reaver games, or at least the Legacy of Cain. I'm not actually sure of the difference, but this was definitely something that I had friends who were really into growing up. Never uh, myself personally, but this might be a chance for us to jump in as well. But Matt, I feel like. Mm-hmm. With a lot of these blasts from the past, one that spoke to, uh, to me sort of was a uh, new DLC for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. Matt, yes, mm-hmm. the Radical Reptiles DLC, which adds, you know, quote unquote, two fan favorite characters from the classic 1987 TV show, uh, Mondo Gecko and Mona Lisa. Matt, mm-hmm. as someone who adored the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles growing up. I do hmm. not know what a Mondo Gecko and a Mona Lisa are. I mean, I know who Mondo Gecko is. I'm pretty sure he was in the uh, latest Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, wasn't he? Couldn't tell you, Matt. Couldn't mm. tell you. But I know I should really get around to Shredder's Revenge because I always have a beat up itch uh, that needs scratching at all times. But mm-hmm. uh, Matt, mm-hmm. Sonic uh, Cross Shadow Generations movie DLC pack will also be released in December. Uh, Keanu Reeves voicing Shadow for this DLC and also the movie did not know <laughs> uh, he was voicing Shadow in the new movie but that kind of oh, makes yeah, sense yeah. Mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. is the new uh, Sonic movie a spiritual successor to Cyberpunk 2077 I know I'm not the first one to make <laughs> that joke but I'm still going to make that joke anyway I mean yeah it basically is Jaren I can't wait for them to bring oh man what's the name of the guy who plays Sonic <laughs> I uh, not Mm-hmm. I only know Idris Elba and now Keanu Reeves uh, and Jim Carrey uh, of people who are in the Sonic movie. Oh, ben Schwartz. Ben Schwartz. I can't wait for to bring Ben Schwartz into <laughs> the uh, cyberpunk universe. Uh, the sequel, Matt. The sequel. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. What else happened, Matt? Mm-hmm. That Fortnite DualSense controller looks awful. Uh, <laughs> also, but split screen. You split screen in Lego Fortnite now. <laughs> I'm not playing Lego Fortnite, unfortunately, Matt. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, something we mentioned earlier in a previous episode. Uh, Fear the Spotlight from Blumhouse Games coming uh, October 22nd. Really looking forward to this, Matt. Matt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was actually thinking about this the other day where okay. with, you know, the High- Silent Hill 2 uh, remake coming, you know, relatively soon as well. Where uh, I was thinking about going back and if... I'm able to find, uh, you know, that game plus the original at reasonable prices. Maybe playing them, you know, side by side just to see how they compare. But once I threw that idea out the window, when I think about classic horror games like, you know, classic Resident Evil, Silent Hills, uh, do you think going back to them now in 2024, them looking like PlayStation 1 games makes them less scary? I think so. Like, I think it's going to be kind of that same thing when you look at um, old, like, horror movies mm-hmm. that have, like, the kind of, like, you know, cheesy CG and, you know, kind of, like, bad costuming. Right. Or, you know, relative, like, bad costuming compared to now. Like, it it looks more B-movie comedy, almost, mm-hmm. or, like, parody. I feel like that might uh might be the effect that happens. Where, again, with Fear the Spotlight, this does have that aesthetic of a PlayStation 1 game where, I don't know, mm-hmm. kind of looking forward to it, uh, giving me some sort of horror nostalgia that I might not actually have. But mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. you know what nostalgia I'll always have? What What's that, Jaren? To be nostalgia. That <laughs> uh-huh. Stellar Blade is getting a photo mode soon and Near Automata collaboration DLC later this year. Again, to be... Uh, no stranger to, I guess, shift up because last year there was that Nikkei cross near Automata uh, collaboration. So, Matt, mm-hmm. this makes all the sense in the world and another reason why <laughs> I want a PlayStation 5 right now. Jaren, I, it looks like a good photo mode. 
<laughs> of course it does, Matt. Of course Jared, it does. I don't know What's if up? you saw it. This wasn't part of State of Play. But did you see that um, Kojima kind of showed off? Or I don't know if it was Kojima. But like they showed off the photo mode for Death Stranding 2. I did not see it. Yeah, Jared, I'm going to send you a link. I, you know, I'll edit out while you're watching it. But like, I want you to see this photo mode because it looks okay. crazy. Matt? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's because I'm not well versed in Death Stranding. But <laughs> two two reactions watching this reel that you shared. Yeah. And we'll probably put this on the show notes or link it in the show notes as well. Mm-hmm. Uh one mm-hmm. I can't tell if this is in or out of character for these characters, just because my perception of what Death Stranding is is the self serious <laughs> narrative. That uh-huh. Uh-huh. you know kojima's trying to present but at the same time this photo mode having these characters in these wacky situations not okay not necessarily a wacky situation but you know mm-hmm. posing having fun it's both it's the polar opposite of what i think death stranding is mm-hmm. but also on brand of what i think a kojima game is yeah where it's <laughs> I'm conflicted in that way, but also at the mm-hmm. same time, this is number two. Mm-hmm. Approaching this weird, uncanny valley where there's <laughs> something off about watching uh, these three women dance in the photo mode and mm-hmm. for it to end in a Polaroid where, Matt, yeah. in theory, I like this photo mode, uh-huh. but at the same time, it's against what I think <laughs> Death Stranding is. Which is also putting me kind of out there, it, in addition to the fact that it's just it's just kind of weird, Matt. It's kind yeah. of weird, but I'm into it. <laughs> Jared, what I there's a couple of things that I really appreciate about this photo mode. The first is that if you're looking like carefully, you can see the dude <laughs> taking the picture in the mirrors. Mm-hmm. Um, the second is that, like, if we haven't described it like very like at all. In this photo mode, it's re- literally just kind of like these characters going through these uh, pose animations, and you take yep. the photo whenever you want. Kind of like in the same way that you would take a photo in um, Pokemon Snap. Right. Jaren, this is like the literal interpretation of a photo mode. And I somehow think that there will not be the kind of like, you know, Stellar Blade equivalent of the photo mode where you're able to pose them however you want. Because it seems, in my head, I wouldn't... I would expect Kojima to be like, no, that's not real enough. This is the real photo mode. So you're saying this is on brand? I think this is so on brand for what I expect out of a Kojima game. Uh, Matt, I'm into it. I'm oddly into it, but it it also... Mm -hmm. There's something terrifying about it. I can't tell you what's terrifying about it, but I'm also... I'm interested, but I'm scared Mm -hmm. at the same time. It's that uncanny valley, Jaren. It's that uncanny valley. Ah, man. Matt, uh... Mm -hmm. What else? Some things that were also mentioned that we can go through real quickly. Uh, arriving in 2025, the Lunar Remastered Collection um, is coming into the PlayStation consoles. Alan Wake 2 DLC, The Lake House, this October. Uh, they showed off a lot of Dragon Age, The Bell Guard, um, coming in October as well. And Matt, mm-hmm. you know, we discussed it briefly, but how was the Monster Hunter news coming out of the state of play? Jaren, coming out of the state of play, Monster Hunter News is very good. Um, you know, it it got its release date of February 28th, 2025. But Jaren, everything after the state of play for Monster Hunter News was was, was really bad. Mm, how so, Matt? Jaren, the specs for Monster Hunter um, Wilds are rough. I thought you were going to say are wild, but same thing. I, I feel like wild is a good one. Right. Um, rough is 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 uh, really rough, Jared. Because um, I think the thing that really stood out for a lot of people is that the um, unrecommended requirements you are only going to be getting sixty frames a second with frame generation, mm. which sounds wild when they're also targeting the um, recommended spec to be a uh, forty sixty. That's rough. That's rough. That's rough. Jaren, you gotta get the uh, the PlayStation Five Pro if you if you want to play this properly. And uh, what they what they have said is going to be a capped thirty frames per second. Matt, mm-hmm. as I said, I'm priced out of the PlayStation <laughs> Five Pro, um, mm-hmm. and we'll see how we feel when GTA Six comes out. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
But uh, yeah, Matt, anything else from the state of play this week? I mean, here, I think the only thing that we haven't talked about that like looked interesting to me is Dynasty Warrior Origins. Okay. I've never been a fan of like, you know, this genre of game, but for some reason, I don't know, this just looked very appealing to me. Like I, I think maybe maybe I've turned on the on the genre and I, I want to give it a try. But Matt, Matt, sometimes you just want to turn your brain off and mm-hmm. fight mm-hmm. a bunch of dudes at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't we all, Matt? Mm-hmm. Don't we? Don't all? we all? Don't we all? Uh, but Matt, that was mm-hmm. our quick run through of the latest Sony State of Play. As people who don't own a PlayStation Five, um, <laughs> a lot of cool stuff at least for showing mm-hmm. off. Mm-hmm. It's a good, yeah, uh, it was a good State of Play, I think. Oh. Power World is also available for PlayStation and Nintendo suing uh, Pocket Pair, but yeah, 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 yeah. You can look up that up on their own time. Matt, mm-hmm. another beefy boy episode this week. Yes. My apologies, but can't uh-huh. end just yet. Mm-hmm. Jaren, of course, we have to end on a don't match me challenge. Yes. And Jaren, you know, within, within our other interests, you know, we, we talk a lot about VTubers. Yep. And Jaren, right now, you know, while we're recording, Amelia Watson's graduation scream is uh, happening. Have that in the background right now, Matt. Mm-hmm. I have it right now. She's dancing in front of a bunch of uh, crying crocodiles, Al- alligators. It's alligators for Ame. Matt, mm-hmm. I'm having this stream in the background as we've been talking has been buffering like crazy. I don't know why, but that might be just because a lot of people are watching this right now. So mm-hmm. 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 what can you do? Mm-hmm. Jared, yeah, I have 109, basically like 110k people, yeah, watching is on my counter as well. But Jaren, I thought, you know, in in honor of Amelia Watson, I would do a don't match me challenge, sort of about Amelia Watson. Okay. So Jaren, as always, the rules are that, you know, I'm going to ask five questions and I'm going to give five answers. All the you know, you, the listener, have to do is to give an answer that isn't the answer that I'm giving. Um, you know, of course, if you want to play on a, you know, quote unquote, harder difficulty, you can try to not match both my answer and Jaren's answer. Yeah. And, you know, as always, this is a podcast. If you need time to think of an answer, just pause us. We're, we're going to be around still. The beauty of our audio journals and the ability to pause our thoughts in real time, mm-hmm. Matt. Mm-hmm. Jaren? Those are the standard rules of don't match me. But I'm going to be adding one additional rule for this one. Okay. Because this is, you know, in honor of Amelia Watson, all of the questions can be answered with Amelia Watson, mm. like as an answer. So Amelia Watson is an answer you are not allowed to pick. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fair enough, Matt. Fair enough. All right. So here is my Amelia Watson don't match me challenge. First off. Name a Hololive member with more than one million subs. You know, there's okay. uh, there's there's quite a lot of them now. Okay, you just gotta name one member that has more than one million subscribers. Not, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared yeah. how you're gonna go with this. Just okay. name that name that member. In three, two, one. I've picked Iris. Ah, oh, Iris, Matt. Matt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had to pick. Uh... One of my favorite How the Life talents, the first one from the ID branch, Muna Hashinova. Good, good pick, Jen. Good pick, good pick. All right. So, my second question. There are a lot of members who, you know, have pets, Jaren. So, my second question is, name a Hollow Life member that is known to have a pet. Oof. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jaren, there's, a, there's like a lot of them have a... You know, kind of talked about how they, they have a pet. Uh, you know, sometimes Matt, they obscure their names, sometimes they don't, but mm-hmm. Are, are we talking about Kefi pet or uh, they have as the wrestling like, fans say, I shoot pet, if you will. They they had a lot of like a real a real pet. Like a lot of them have said they have like real pets and they, you know, will sometimes show up on their stream under, you know, a a fake name. But you know, they they have shown that they have like or mentioned that they have like actual pets. Okay. You give that answer in three, two, one. Jared, you cannot let this Don't Match Me Challenge distract you from the fact that Takora has a fucking monkey. Matt <laughs> was so scared. You Because Matt, 
<laughs> at a glance, I thought, oh no, the only one I know is Pecoro has a monkey. But, <laughs> you know, as we said, if you don't know something, just do a quick Google. Uh, might have mm-hmm. cheated for this one, but I went with... Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, Noel has hamsters. So I went mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. Uh, Pecoro's third generation uh, generation mate in Noel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. So for question three, I think probably an easier one because this is like, you know, much, much easier knowledge than uh, who has a pet. Yep. But my third question is name a blonde hollow live member. You know, or you know any character that has like blonde or yellowish hair, any anything that falls within that like spectrum. Okay. So, name that member in three, two, one. Jaren, I have gone with Kayla. Man, not I love Ka- Kayla. Not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Would you say Eofi has blondish hair? It's like platinum blonde. I think is the like color of her hair. Do you accept it? I used to think it was pink, but like. Yeah, I think I think she like falls within it. Okay, like very closely, or like very barely within it. <laughs> barely, <laughs> barely, barely. Got through on a technicality. I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Not, mm-hmm. As mm-hmm. I said earlier, we take those dubs here on the mistake zone. <laughs> uh-huh. mm-hmm. All right. So my fourth question is: Name a Hollow Life member that is 150 centimeters or shorter. Ooh. So you know, there's uh just like a handful of these uh these members so you just gotta name one of them name that member in three two one i'm going with laplace matt Mm -hmm. i originally was gonna go with laplace but had to go Mm -hmm. with anya Mm -hmm, mm Hmm. good answer jerry good answer good answer thanks man of course the last the last question which i think is probably the expected question my fifth question for this don't match me challenge is Name a member of Hollow Life English Myth. So just name that member. And remember, no Miloya Watson. Mm-hmm. In three, two, one, I'm going with Ina. Matt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Matt. Mm-hmm. I'm out. <laughs> we take those W's here in the mistakes zone, but we also mm-hmm. take those L's. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Matt. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. That's a Dr. Oopsie <laughs> on my part. Oh, no, Jared. Well, you know, hopefully our listeners didn't also make a Dr. Oopsie. That? Mm Mm-hmm. Where did we go wrong? (laughs) Jared? I I believe it was Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh. Game Facts is Yu-Gi-Oh social board. Shout out to the 557. Matt? Uh Uh-huh. And shout out to you, as always, for joining me this week on The Mistake Zone and also editing this podcast and putting together our don't match me challenge for the week you know thanks jared and as always i want to thank you for hosting this episode and you know keeping this beefy boy of an episode going thanks man matt Mm -hmm. also have to thank some amelia watson uh see her when you see her Mm because not uncharted territory for hollow live which is Mm kind of cool Mm -hmm. Uh, shout out to Tony Hawk for 25 years of Tony Hawking, even though we don't talk about Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5 or Tony Hawk's Pro Skater HD. Uh, what else? Matt? Mm-hmm. Shout out to UFOs. <laughs> shout out to the number 50 once again, Matt. Mm-hmm. Uh, shout out to Galactica. <laughs> <laughs> and shout out to uh, Galaga. Mm-hmm. Uh, and shout out to the 80s. Matt, when did the Galaga come out? And when did Galactica come out? Not is Galactica a real thing. I'm just running on fumes right now. <laughs> Jared, I feel like I've never considered those. Or I've always considered those to be the same, like different names for the same thing. But I actually don't know if that's true anymore. Matt, mm-hmm. shout out to Astrobot. And shout out to us not owning PS5s yet. <laughs> Let's put the yet over there. The yet, the yet is very strong there, Jared. <laughs> very strong indeed. But Matt, mm-hmm. Please take it away. This has been the Mistake Zone, and we're all out of Emilio Watson. Not for now. For now.